in loyalty to the tenets of the Christian faith, C.S. Lewis won the admiration of thousands in England and here in the United States. Nevertheless, the following is such an attempt. In other words, we're going to try to evaluate his theology. We've already got into it a little bit. How, even after what we've just went over, the seeming loyalty that he has, and this following that he has, in light of what we've just read, how can he... I don't understand how he could have this. I, I just, I've just i never understood it, even as a baby Christian, because I found out about this um, kind of as a baby Christian, a lot of this stuff. It wasn't hard to find. What did C.S. Lewis believe on creation? C.S. Lewis believed that evolution was true to an extent in the past, but that it will be superseded in the future. Now again, every single thing I'm talking about here is referenced in different books, okay? He also believed, for we have good reason to believe that animals existed long before men. For long centuries God perfected the animal form, which was to become the vehicle of humanity and the image of himself. You understand why they said he believed in theistic evolution? He believed that animals were here before us, and that it sounds to me like they were the ve- it says he, they were the vehicle of humanity. Well, that sounds like we have man evolved into, uh, from an animal to a human. And then he says, eventually God caused a new kind of consciousness to descend upon this organism. You'll see, he refers to mankind as a species as well. Well, that's what the that's what the New Agers do. That's what that's what the glo- people that want to depopulate the planet. I, I read you that um, that quote from um, Marie Strong in my Avion Flu presentation, where he said the, the mankind, this species, is out of control as far as the breeding goes. And the species must be stabilized and rapidly. Whenever you hear mankind referred to as a species, typically that's something that you'll hear the millionaires and billionaires like Marie Strong and Ted Turner do in order to justify depopulation. Well, they, he has this very much same kind of, of, of writings with what he says. So God calls a new kind of consciousness to descend upon this organism. So in other words, we evolved essentially from some kind of animal, and then God caused a new consciousness to, to, to descend on this organism known as man. He said that on Problem of Pain... Page 133 and 77. I'll give that reference. Man, he also said, man is the highest of the animals. That's a quote. Another quote. But he, man, still remains a primate and an animal. End of quote. That was from uh, Reflections on Psalms, page 115 and 129. Then he also said, if you mean simply that man is physically descended from animals, I have no objection. End of quote. He held that the Genesis account came from pagan and mythical sources. Pagan! Oh, now we're getting into the absolute, totally question of the Word of God. Well, again, how could you say the stuff that he's saying and not question the Word of God? The Word of God took no preeminence in this man's life. That's obvious from already from what we've looked at. I'm only on the second page. I wanted to do a very, very thorough study on this man, because, again, he's held in such high regard. This is from his own writings. Easily to verify. So, if you want to persist in following this man after you've heard this, now you're in a much more precarious position. Because, again, the Bible says to whom much is given, much is required. Then it says... He held again that Genesis account came from pagan and mythical sources. He says, I have no therefore I have therefore no difficulty accepting, say, the view of those scholars who tell us that the account of the creation in Genesis is derived from earlier Semitic stories which were pagan and mythical. That's what he believed about the book of Genesis. Sounds like a real staunch defender of the faith. You know, like the Bible talks about in Jude, earnestly contending for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Oh, he's earnestly contending for it. He's earnestly trying to destroy it, is what he's doing. Now Genesis 2.20 says, And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was found 
there was not found an help meet for him. No help meet for Adam's needs could be found for, for him from among the animals. That's a great point, isn't it? Now, Adam was created separately and distinctively. They said, the Lord said, come let us make man in our image, in our image. Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Some people will say it's Father God, Mother Goddess, and Jesus, like the pagan trinity. That's, that's a very common belief system. Um, actually, they actually do believe that in Mormonism at the deepest levels. But that's a, that's a whole other study. Anyway, so Adam gave name to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found in help me for him. No help me for Adam's knees could be found for him be, among the animals because he was not an animal. Okay? He wasn't a donkey and God waved a magic wand and turned him into a human being. Like, kind of like C.S. Lewis is expecting us to believe this. Adam needed someone created in the image of God like he was himself in order to be a helpmeet for him. God knew this also. Genesis 127, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. C.S. Lewis cast many of the animals as being like God in some way since this is necessary to arrive at what the Bible says without actually be taken literally. Well, that's how he portrays these animals in like the Chronicle of Narnia and a lot of these other cult fiction fantasy things. These animals take on the personages of God. Like the lion, I believe, in the Chronicle of Narnia who was like the Christ. We're going to talk about that more later. Thus man... Thus man is the closest to God, but he's still an animal. So if we go further, what did he believe on um, salvation? This is a quote from one of his books. Let's see which one it is. Mere Christianity. This is a quote from Mere Christianity, page 176-177. There are people in other religions who are being led by God's secret influence to consecrate, no, to concentrate on those parts of their religion which are in agreement with Christianity and who thus belong to Christ without knowing it. Did you know that, Doug? Billy Graham told it to him. Yeah, and, and so did Robert Schuller, because that's exactly what they believe too. Oh no, not Billy Graham or Robert Schuller. Stalwart defender of the faith? Robert Schuller? Oh yeah. I saw him. They said it on TV. The interview, you can go up on Google and watch. Well, I'll, I'll send you, if you don't believe me, I'll send you the, the thing on... Well, look, just do a, a search for Billy Graham on my sermons. Okay? And go to the PDF file and you, and, and, um, you can read the whole transcript of the interview. If you don't believe that, then you can go keyword search it on Google or YouTube and watch it. That's a very common thing. Well, I wonder where Billy Graham and Shula heard about it for the first time. Maybe they heard about it through C.S. Lewis. There are people in other religions who are being led by God's secret influence to concentrate on those parts of their religion which are in agreement with Christianity and who thus belong to Christ without knowing it? What a bunch of lies this is. They belong to Christ without knowing it. Wow, that, that's, that's a pretty amazing thing. I, I've never... Uh, yeah, how unscriptural can you possibly get? Many, and here he goes on to say this, many of the good pagans, long before Christ's birth, may have been in this position. Good pagans. As though there's... You're either saved or you're not saved. You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt, thou shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10. For ye are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But there is only one way. There is only one way. Some Buddhists cannot get grandfathered in and not even know about it. That's an impossibility. Jesus Christ said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That is it. 
So, again, more absolute total apostate heretical lies. What did he believe on heaven? He said, this is from one of his books, another one of his books, all scriptural imagery, harps, crowns, gold, etc., is of course merely symbolical, an attempt to express the inexpressible. Number one, how could he know this? So what is like heaven, like this blank piece of paper and we just kind of go there and do nothing? If this is revolting to say the least. Jesus is very clear in this. John 14, 2 said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Well, evidently, according to Lewis, that's all symbolical. Like, I would go to this reprobate to get advice. But you know what? Most Christians do. Most Christians go to this man. Unbelievable. I'm three pages into this, and I mean, I think I've heard enough to... <laughs> but, let's really look at this in totality. Jesus would have told us if all the descriptions of heaven were not real. We have to take it by faith or call him a liar. A man cannot call Jesus Christ a liar and be saved. Which is essentially what C.S. Lewis does in his writings. When he contradicts the word of God. You're basically making the word of God of none effect by your traditions. Lewis's problem with the descriptions of heaven being literal is that he judged the Bible by his own half bushel. As we will see, the Chronicles of Narnia is absolutely loaded with symbolism. So he read the Bible in light of himself. That is, he made God in his own image. Isn't that what most people do? Well, I don't believe God would send me to hell. He's a God of love. Okay, what have you just done there? You've created your own religion. What did C.S. Lewis do with all of his writings, essentially, because so much of what he said was non-biblical? He created his own religion. That's why he has his own cult following to this day. Two million books per year sold by this reprobate? And he's been dead since 63? The devil's very good at what he does. Now we've got the movies, now we've got the kids being influenced by this stuff. Now, granted, the Bible said it was going to be this way. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, that there was going to be a great falling away, and that God was going to be the one that sends the strong delusion, that they will believe a lie, that they might all be damned to receive not the love of the truth. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, God's going to be the one that does this. So this is fulfillment of Scripture. It's sad. It's a sad indictment on the Christian church, pseudo-Christian church, but it is fulfillment of Scripture. And, as the Bible says, and yet my people love to have it so. They took pleasure in unrighteousness. They did not want the truth. In the book, The Great Divorce, he says, there's no literal hell. It is a state of mind. Every shutting up of the creature within the dungeon of its own mind, in the end, is hell. Uh, now, Luke says in 16.23... And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. This was the rich man. The Bible is very clear on what hell is like. No one takes the word of God literally. No one who takes the word of God literally need has any questions to what it is. Three times Jesus described it as thus, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Mark 9.44. C.S. Lewis did not want to believe in this because he knew he was going there. Oh, now you've really crossed the line. Whatever. Again, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? How could this man have went to heaven? How could the Holy Spirit of God dwelt in this man and never in his whole life convicted him of the rank apostate heresy that he was involved in? How, how could that be so? Fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, goodness, faith, temperance. Where did... Wh this man wasn't putting forth truth. He was putting forth a little bit of truth mingled with lies. Which is what the which which is what the devil is most 